it's let's see record this meeting oh yeah we're recording um what is it here i've got no idea my guess is it's in the high 60s the low 70s but i was out on the lake i was sculling on the lake here for about an hour and a half before it's gorgeous i'm looking out well i don't know if this is going to work but we'll try because i got my little computer but can you see can you see and those of you who are on the computer can you see out the window in the lake there or not? No, just a bunch of glare from the, it's too yeah, bright. That's what I thought. But it's beautiful. It is beautiful here. And I see Anne has joined us. Can you hear us, Anne? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Oh, yes, we can. And I could, be in the, I could be in the highlands here if you were looking out the window. <laughs> I could so. It's not like it's like one of these narrow lakes that oh. <laughs> is everywhere. I'm not kidding you, honestly. I mean, it's really pretty. It's really pretty. It's called it's called Lake Massawippi, right? And, uh, and it is um, where am I? I am just north of the Vermont border, about half an hour. In fact, the, lake, the southern end of the lake almost gets to the border. So this is where I am right now. And last week, last week uh, I was in Vermont with one of our um, regulars who was visiting there. So, so that's where we are. So what we're okay. doing right now is, is what's called shooting the breeze. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're very good. We're very good at that on this call, shooting the breeze. Yeah. That's what we're doing. Because it usually takes about ten minutes to gather everybody, uh, yeah. and as people call in, and they will. Uh, let's see, it's three o two, so it's a little. Uh, it's three o two. It's three o two in in in. It's three o two in your time, Dennis. My my, I haven't changed my timing on my laptop. It's six o two here, and it's eleven o two with you, right? That's right. Yeah. Uh -huh. So if I look a little bit bleary eyed, you know why. <laughs> Yeah, the off you're doing fine. <laughs> so, and we're getting we're getting um, all kinds of weather reports from around the country. So there well, we are. Dennis is in Tucson, which or where which is where I live normally, mm -hmm. and he's telling me it's, it was 70 degrees there one day this week, which is absolutely unheard of. Well, that must be a low for the that must be an all time low, Dennis. Is that right? <laughs> Oh, we could do well, the I was I just said seventies, so that could be seventy nine, <laughs> not seventy, but <laughs> it definitely was down down there though. Okay. But we we still talk in Fahrenheit. I'm sorry, Anne. We're, you're, you're gonna... That's okay. I'm I'm still of the age where I I kind of for hot temperatures I still kind of think in that scale. Um, you know, for the lower temperatures I'm quite comfortable with the understanding the other scale, but when it gets to the hot ones, I'm like, what what does that translate to? I like it when you talk in 70 and 80 and things like that. <laughs> Not that we see 80 here very much. <laughs> so, uh, well, well, it's all right. You, you 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 came on five minutes too late. Dennis was just talking in the hundreds. What's what's, oh. what's the temperature right now, Dennis? Well, not sure. I was uh, we were out at lunchtime and it was 102. Oh, they, uh, <laughs> oh boy. Okay, eat your heart out. No, you don't want it that hot. Not not not, not really. I'm a redhead. I would burn far too easily. <laughs> okay. Okay. So um, so let me see who I see here. I see myself, and I see Anne. And I see Jake, uh, I see Tibo Lincecum in DC. Um, and I see Dennis and not too many more. They're, they're a slow start. I think one of the problems was I did a call from here last night. I did Peter's call because he's in Europe. And um, we had at least two guys that thought, that got confused and thought it was the high risk. Mike Tamales was on the line. There you are, Jake. Mike Tamales was on the line last night. 
You were up. Yeah, I was I was I was on there when he when he he, he popped in and he popped back out again. Yeah. Yeah, it was weird. I, my computer overloaded. I got a message that my computer overloaded and I lost I had vid visuals but I didn't have any sound. So I said, "Well, I'm just going to leave." Which I told you I was going to do anyway. Yeah. But but I'm glad I was glad to hear from him that he's doing a, you know, at least still kicking. Yeah. Yeah, I, w I was too. Um, hopefully he'll come back on today and he'll tell us what's going on because his main man is in Italy. And uh, so we have some people um, in some far flung places and like like Maui, which sounds very um, exotic, but the um, the prostate cancer health care in Maui um, is not the best, shall we say. So um, they, we do a whole bunch of navigation with these fellas, and um, this is a guy that has really advanced disease, and he's young, and um, we haven't heard from him for a while. And um, sometimes it's a little get it's a little difficult to convince him to comply with some of the things we suggest, and um, and so we were interested to see what was what was happening um, with him yesterday. So I have a feeling that he'll be, he'll be back talking with us pretty soon. Um, and then let's see, we have um, right now, and then we have Tebow on the line, and Tebow will talk a little bit, but Tebow's in, um, in his late 40s, and he's in um, uh, Maryland right now, in College Park, Maryland, which is about, 40 minutes to an hour north of DC. And um, he's lined up for a very interesting trial, possibly, which he'll tell you about, but it involves um, uh, blood marrow transfusions and, um, and pembrolizumab, Keytruda. So, um, so, He's hoping to find a match. That that's been that's been the hang up for a while. So we'll we'll we will visit. So it, I don't know where everybody is today, but I I have a feeling that they'll all come flooding in. Um, we usually finish up with about uh, anywhere from a minimum of about twelve to about twenty five people is our usual group size. And what I had. Um, I, I I think I checked in with everybody. Oh, someone else just came in. Who who just joined us? I'd be Mike Tamales. Oh, your ears were burning, Mr. Tamales. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Rick. We were just saying that you were with us yesterday, and we hope you'll be back today. Um, what I had asked Anne to do. Um, was just to talk a little bit about uh, what um, Prostate Cancer UK is doing in the United Kingdom in the support field. Uh, some of you will know, but not all of you, that the Prostate Cancer UK is the major prostate cancer organization in the United Kingdom and fills the function of both what Prostate Cancer Foundation does here, in, or in other words, they marshal most of the research money that goes out, not all of it because there's government money too, but they are responsible for awarding a lot of the grants just like PCF does here. In addition, they, fill, they fulfill the functions that Zero fulfills in terms of advocacy and to some extent what us two fulfills in the um, in the area of support. Um, and the one thing they do that nobody does here, and they do it unbelievably well, is they create prostate cancer awareness at a level that we just don't see in this country. So um, we have had so many people say, well, why can't prostate cancer be like breast cancer? Why can't we? Where's our Susan G. Komen? Why aren't the football players, the National League football players, wearing pink? Um, you know, why is it that that 
uh, you go out go, go out everywhere and 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 you see pink everywhere. I should have said, why aren't the national football players wearing blue? Um, we see them wearing pink boots, and it drives men crazy when they see big hulking football players wearing pink boots. And we have no exposure with uh, in in the major sports. A little bit in in baseball. Uh, almost nothing in in basketball, um, pretty much nothing in in, in football. And here's PC UK, and they have done such an incredible job. I mean, you turn on the radio and you hear their partners, their broadcast partners talking about prostate cancer. And then you wonder why it is that you see the newscasters and the sportscasters wearing little blue men, um, which would be like our blue ribbons. Uh, I just can't even begin to tell you what, what what an incredible job it is that they've done. So um, I have been talking to, or ANCAN has been talking to Prostate Cancer about just for uh, Prostate Cancer UK for about a year now, only because the board chair happens to be um, a guy I was at high school with, and. Um, uh, we didn't call it high school, but I'm trans. I'm translating, and I'm I'm using a I'm using Americanisms. Otherwise, these guys aren't going to know what the heck I'm talking about. But we were in the same class at school together from about the age of twelve to about the age of eighteen, and it's a total coincidence. And so when I was is that the form? Is that a form that you're in 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 uh, England? Is it, they call it a form? Yeah, we were we were in we were in first form through sixth form together, but okay. we were. We were studying different stuff. He was a scientist, and 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 I was a uh, uh, a laggard. Um, so um, I reconnected with John, and and it's been a really great um, it's really been a really great communication. And so I reached out to uh, Prostate Cancer UK, and I I'm hopeful that we're going to be able to collaborate with them, and 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 try and uh, start the sort of virtual group that we have here um, or virtual groups that we have here. And we invited Anne on the call so she could hear how this group works. So that's the background. I just want to welcome a couple more people. Bill Burhans has joined us. Hey, Bill. Hey, Rick. How are you doing? Dave, maybe I can see I'm looking in your direction. <laughs> Well, if I maybe if I uh, go over to the window and open it and shout, you might be able to hear me. You're not yeah, far away. We're about an hour. We're about an hour distance apart, and I'll call you tomorrow, and we'll we'll sort up maybe see you on Thursday. Um, yeah, so, sounds good. Um, Bill has joined us, and um, Paul Frieder in Florida has joined us, and uh, let me see if there's anybody else. There isn't. I don't have anyone else to welcome. So, Anne, why don't you just tell us a little bit about um, about what you're doing? I should add, by the way, that we are us two endorsed. We're the only virtual support group um, that they have. We may be the only virtual support group for any sort of disease, too, but we are us two endorsed. Thanks very much, and thank you very much for letting me join in tonight. I'm uh, really, really pleased to be here. Um, I am sorry if I do look a bit rough around the edges. It's quite late over here, <laughs> and I'm an early bird, so um, yeah, it's getting on for the kind of time when I'm usually going to my bed. Anyway, um, yeah, so to tell you just a little bit about um, Prostate Cancer UK, um, I suppose we were quite a small charity until 2012 um, when we rebranded um, and we merged with another prostate cancer charity at the time. Um, and we became Prostate Cancer UK. Um, and during that process, we did a bit of analysis about um, the way we appeared to people and the amount of recognition that we had. And actually it was quite low. Um, we had previously been called the Prostate Cancer Charity, um, but that led to quite a lot of confusion um, with people saying, well, which one? <laughs> <laughs> so we, we gave ourselves a more distinctive name and we gave ourselves a much more distinctive image than we'd had. Um, and I, I'm only mentioning this because it, it does play a part in, I suppose, the whole kind of 
process of what we've managed to do in the last few years in terms of increasing the recognition. Um, but it is just one strand of, of what we've done. Um, we have done a lot of work in a lot of areas really to try and bring prostate cancer to the forefront. Um, when I started um, with Prostate Cancer uh, UK in 2010, and I was going around support groups then, um, I was hearing just what you've said yourself, uh, Rick, about you know uh, guys saying, well, why can't we have the same level of recognition that breast cancer has? Why, you know, what, why is there not the same kind of movement there um, that the women have for breast cancer? Um, and I think really over the years, what we've been trying to do it, it, it is actually to try and achieve that. But we've had to do it on lots of different fronts. That there's been no one thing that I think has contributed to the success. We we very consciously, um, I, I suppose, have started to take much more care with our communications. We um, are very good at kind of finding good stories to put out there in the media. Um, we're very good at connecting with. Uh, men who want to tell their stories and utilising their case studies and getting them out um, into the news. Um, we are very good as well at responding to new stories that come up. Um, so we try and uh, you know, have a, a good robust response ready for when there's an article appearing on the news, for example, about a new treatment, things like this. We want to be there and we want to be available to media so that they come to us and they ask us and that increases our exposure. Um, we did invest in some campaigns. Um, so I think our first big campaign after our rebrand was the Sledgehammer campaign, um, where we used television advertising for the first time. Um, and again, that, that helped increase our profile. We've gone on then to have a couple of campaigns um, called Men United, um, really trying to draw on this idea that we want to bring men together in the same way that women have come together against breast cancer. Um, so we, we've tried to use these as a vehicle for reaching people. Um, we have done things like negotiate partnerships. So um, we have looked quite heavily at sporting sorts of partnerships. Um, we have had for the last few years now, a partnership with the English Football League. Um, and that has been really successful in terms of raising the profile and as you say, we do see now um, any of the football league managers, when you see them on the television during the matches, they're all wearing the Man of Men badge. Um, and it is really increasing the exposure. You know, we have um, some football clubs that have been wearing our logo on their strips. There's been um, pitch side advertising. And also um, that part of that partnership has been allowing us to go in with volunteers um, during some of the matches to do bucket shakes, um, you know, collections, but also to hand out information about prostate cancer as well. So um, that has, has really um, kind of been quite successful for us. Um, and we're in the process of setting up um, those arrangements for 2018's matches um, as well. We were very fortunate in that we made a contact with uh, a guy called Jeff Sterling who is um, really well known over here because he presents a football programme on a Saturday afternoon on Sky. Um, and um, he's, he's a figure that is very, very familiar to lots and lots of men. Um, and he had a friend who had prostate cancer and he decided that he wanted to do something for us. Um, so last year, he walked a series of marathons for us. We called it Jeff's March for Men. Um, and we invited people to participate along with us, uh, along with them, um, and a lot of people did that. We ran it again this year. He decided that he was going to walk even more marathons. Um, so um, this year he, he did, uh, I think it was about five more marathons that he did. Um, and, uh, you know, we got a good number of people walking along with them, getting sponsorship from their friends, but also just um, being able to raise awareness as they went. Um, so wherever they stopped, the, you know, it, it was an opportunity to raise awareness about prostate cancer. So we've been very fortunate with Jeff being on board as well. Um, we, um, I suppose we've done other things as well, like we, we're very aware that the um, risk of prostate cancer for black men is much higher. Um, so um, you're talking about in the UK, a one in four um, risk, lifetime risk, as opposed to a one in eight. Um, lifetime risk. 
And um, so we've tried to do some targeted work, um, raising awareness in the black community over here. Um, and uh, we started a campaign in January called Stronger Knowing More, which we targeted in the areas with the highest populations um, of, of black men. Um, so really, um, you're looking at Birmingham and London um, as the main ones. And we've um, built contacts within the black community there. Um, we've used high profile celebrities um, in terms of some advertising there um, to really try and reach out to people um, and, and raise the awareness there. Um, so we're, we're, kind of, we're always looking at new opportunities for how we can raise the awareness. But it, the, I suppose the campaigns and the using celebrities are really only one strand. But um, one thing that we did um, over three years with funding from Deloitte was that we recruited a large number of volunteers who had all been affected in some way or another by prostate cancer um, and trained them up to be able to run information stands mm -hmm. and be able to do um, talks. Um, so we had, a, as I say, about 250 volunteers signed up for that. Um, we reached over 420,000 contacts. So um, that was a range of contacts. So it might just have been handing out a, a little information Z card about prostate cancer, or it could have been actually having a conversation with someone about it. But 420,000 contacts. Um, we ran over 1,600 events, um, usually in workplaces or in clubs or in community settings. Um, and we tried to get feedback from people who had attended those events as well, just to see if the contact that they'd had with us was actually having an effect. And actually 83% of the people who responded to our request for follow-up information said that they had gone on to have a further conversation about prostate cancer with somebody else. So I think it's been really important to us that we've had this pool of volunteers who've been willing to have conversations with people, who've been willing to go out and actually just stand at information stands, talk to people and kind of, I suppose the thing that the guys would always tell you when they're on information stands is that it's never guys who come up and take the information off of them. It's usually partners. <laughs> um, so um, a, a lot of our guys are very, very good at, at, at kind of grabbing people's wives and partners and saying, you know, have one of these for your husband. Um, but uh, I mean, I'm being a little bit facetious there, but they, it's something that the guys always do say to us when they've been doing these stands. Um, but we we found that that has really made an impact and although the funding from Deloitte has finished now we are still carrying on with that work what we've done is we've just brought it into our volunteering program rather than have it as a standalone program but the awareness is still um, and it, it, it's still ongoing um, in terms of the individual things that we're doing in support um, we have our specialist helpline which is run by specialist nurses, um, but we also have peer support volunteers who are attached to that helpline. So it means that somebody can phone up our helpline and say, I'd really like to be put in touch with someone who can talk about their own experience of, it might be a particular type of treatment or it might be dealing with side effects, um, but we can match them up with a trained volunteer um, who's had their own similar experience. Um, and, that, and that's telephone-based support. Um, the, we've extended our information, our, our, our specialist nurse service to include not just telephone calls, but um, emails um, and live chat as well. So there's a variety of ways that people can access the, the specialist nurses um, that, you know, didn't, wasn't, wasn't available before. Um, we have the support groups now the way that it runs with prostate cancer uk is we don't run any of our own support groups um so we have links with lots of independent support groups and the job that myself and my colleague sue do is we, we create those links we maintain those links we offer people from support groups information advice resources so we can offer grant funding to those groups uh, we can help them with um, kind of advice they need maybe when they're starting up a group and um, we can help them a bit with you know planning their advertising we can help by providing training and support skills things like that so we try and resource support groups as best as possible 
We also look at areas that don't have any support groups um, and we try and work with either interested patients in those areas to try and get one started or we work with a local healthcare professional who might be interested in getting a support group started there as well. But the newest thing that we are looking at in terms of support is virtual support groups. Um, and what we've decided to do in the initial stages is basically find these and targeted ones um, at groups who we know are not accessing face-to-face -face groups. So um, for us in the UK, we know that um, gay and bisexual men are not tending to access face-to-face -face support groups. Um, we do have in the UK um, about three discrete face-to-face -face support groups that are specifically for gay and bisexual men. Um, but obviously, if you're not based in London, Birmingham or Manchester, then it's maybe quite hard for you to actually engage with those groups. Um, so we wanted to see if offering a virtual group um, for um, them might actually be helpful. Um, and we are working on the development of that at the moment um, with our hope that we can get that started um, in September. We'll do six months um, of trialling of that um, and we'll see how it goes within that period. Um, we also want to look at virtual support groups for African and Caribbean men um, and for transgender women affected by prostate cancer. Um, and additionally, we want to look at virtual support groups for men who are on active surveillance. Um, because again, this is another group who are, in the UK certainly are not accessing face-to-face -face support groups. So we really want to try and see if um, a virtual support group is something that actually might be useful to them. So we, we're we really at the initial stages of this, which is why it's so nice to come along here tonight and, and actually see how um, and hear how your own group works. because. Um, you're, you're absolutely right, we've really struggled to try and find anybody else that's doing a similar sort of thing. Um, and, uh, and we have a lot of questions about how it might work. And we have a lot of questions about what are the pitfalls that we need to try and avoid. Um, and, uh, you know, we don't even at the moment really know what the level of uptake might be. Um, so we are very cautiously saying we want to start just with trialing it, see how it goes, see if we can iron out any teething problems with it, um, and, and then take it from there. But it is really exciting because I think, you know, it's really important that we try and look beyond what we're already offering to try and see if there are other things that we can do that we can in increase people's access to group-based support because we know how much benefit that people get from being able to speak to other people about their experiences and ask other people questions and learn from other people's experiences and the more that we can make that accessible the better so that's what we're really hoping to do over the next few months yeah. i'll shut up yeah. <laughs> no, no, I, mean, I think what you what you touched on at the end i'm going to throw this open a little bit and we'll get in and guys we'll get into the regular part of the support group we'll check in with everybody we want to make sure you all have some time we, we might come we want to talk to you and see how you're doing but I think one of the really important points that you touch on is that um, if you live in a population center, it's somewhat easier to access a support group. But if you don't live in a population center, it can be very, very difficult. Or if you have a physical disability, or if you have some sort of um, social disability. And what we found is that these groups um, really appeal to men who, where it isn't that easy to connect to a support group. Now we run, we run a low risk group, or we run a high risk group, we run a caregivers group, we run a, a, a group for um, purely emotional support. It's not a technical group at all. Uh, the the high risk group is probably the most, the high risk advanced recurrent group, this group is probably the most successful because there are very, very few advanced groups, uh, even in the population centers. I don't know how it is with you, whether, but, but you all hear some of these men, they'll tell you themselves, it's the worst when they walk into a support group and they've got to listen to a guy talking about active surveillance when they're dealing with end of life issues. 
And so we're able to hone in on those high risk, advanced, recurrent themes. And we run this group every week. And, you know, right now, uh, I'm just looking, we've got about 12 people, 10, 12 people on the call. Um, but that's a, that's, that's pretty constant. I mean, we're, and we don't advertise anymore. Um, we're going to be showing up at PCRI. People are going to be learning about what we do. And my guess is that three months from now, we're probably going to have to be adding groups because once we get to more than 20, 25 men on this, and it happens quite frequently, there's just not enough time. So I want, what I'd like to do is just, if anybody's got any questions for Anne, um, if they're curious at all about prostate cancer support in the UK, um, or how we might be able to uh, duplicate their model, um, let me throw it open for five minutes or so, 10 minutes at the most, and then we'll move into the group and Anne can hear how we work. Oh, go ahead, Steve. Um. Thanks, Bill. Um, so, uh, Anne, I'm sorry, I missed uh, some of your uh, the opening remarks, um, but I think one of the key differences here in the U.S. Uh, versus the U.K. is uh, the accessibility to doctors in healthcare, and a lot of the discussions we have is is around, you know, how do you access care, expensive care, expensive drugs? How do you talk to your doctor in a way that's not adversarial, uh, that's collegial, so that you're directing your care somewhat? to the level of your experience and knowledge. And um, I find that a lot of the guys on the call here are sometimes intimidated by what their doctors tell them and, and won't stand up to their doctor, even though clearly we tell them that, that's just not right, you know? So I guess what's the experience in the UK around that with National Health Service and so on? Uh, is that a different experience? I think. I think there's similarities of experience, but possibly for different reasons. Um, and I think I think men over here do still have a little bit of a problem sometimes in talking to their doctors because there's still this culture of the doctor knows best. Um, and there's still a bit of a culture of you, you don't challenge the doctor. Um, <laughs> um, and. Uh, and I think that, and certainly, you, you know, particularly with the generation that is, you know, maybe most experiencing prostate cancer at the moment, that is definitely, you know, something that, you know, was very strong, you know, with that generation that you, you, you don't challenge the doctor. But I think one of the other challenges that we have is that a lot of people are very used to the doctor saying, right, this is what's wrong with you and this is the treatment we're going to give you for it. And actually, sometimes so. Sometimes what's happening now is the doctor saying, "Well, we could do this, or we could do that," and it's your decision. And I think a lot of men over here really struggle with that um, yeah. because they're, they're not used to getting that that kind of choice. Um, and I think um, that, that that can be really hard for people. And I think that's absolutely one of the benefits where things like support groups come in because they then have the opportunity to say, "Well." you opted for that treatment how was that for you um and you know what 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 you know what were the things you took into consideration when you opted for that treatment um and and i think that's a, a really useful thing to do but um but yeah i so i think there are similarities but i think the drivers for those similarities might be slightly different in the two countries yeah makes sense yeah, uh, you know, it, it's so interesting you say that because that's a huge problem here. Men are just not used to not having their doctor make the decision for them, and they find it super frustrating. That's not something we find quite as much on this call, but it's hugely prevalent on the on the low and intermediate risk call and hugely frustrating. Um, so it, it's, it's a really good point. Bill, you wanted to, you, you had a question? And I'd first like to um, say thanks very much for joining us, especially because it must be going on midnight over there across the pond. Uh -huh. I'm really impressed with what your organization has been able to accomplish. And I'm curious about how large it is in terms of the number of people that actually work for the organization and how many of those are involved in fundraising and advertising. Um, so we have around about 180 staff 
So we're not a massive organisation staff wise. Um, in terms of the size of the fundraising department, um, <coughs> it's not the biggest department um, because the department that I'm in, which is support and influencing, is the largest one and we have about 60 in it. So fundraising department maybe has about 35 people, 40 people in it. Um, very much um, everybody within that has specialisms. So we have a kind of sporting events team. Um, we have a supporter care team that deal with the kind of smaller community fundraising. Um, we have a special events team. Um, we do have a marketing team as well um, and a media team um, as well. So you know that there are staff who are very much focused on the you know the the bringing in the support side of things um but uh, but yeah it, it, it it's it's interesting that you know they, they're not the largest part of the organization the support side um the support and influencing certainly um so direct support and um, uh, things like campaigning um are actually the, the bigger part of the organization um, but we have a very, I think we have a very effective setup for our fundraising team. Um, the way that they're organised allows them to, you know, really kind of focus and become very specialist in what they do. So we have people who um, are purely about um, bringing in major donors, and we have people who are, you know, focusing on legacies. We have people who are um, focusing on, you know, I suppose contacts with celebrities that we think will be useful and trying to nurture people who we know are maybe well known in the public eye but have some form of connection with prostate cancer that might be willing to you know come and help us actually raise a bit of publicity so but yeah we're not we're not uh, although, although we we kind of have a good deal of kind of influence and, and a good deal of you know people are aware of us now we're still not a massive organization kind of staff wise well i i just to give you a frame of reference i think us too currently has either three and a half or four full-time employees um and uh they run somewhere around 200 support groups they, they coordinate about 200 support groups but by our standards um that's a big organization, I would say. Anybody else like to um anybody else like to, to ask Anne a question or raise any issue with Anne? Okay. Well let me let me do this, Anne. Um feel free to chime in at any time. We're gonna move into the um the regular part of our group. We usually run these groups for uh two hours. Um, feel feel free to drop off at any time. We fully understand. We can touch base later. You can get you can catch me at, at any time. Uh, normally, what we'll do is um, give time to anybody that's never been on the call before. But that isn't the case today because everybody that I see who's on the call right now, at least, um, has, has joined us. So what I'm going to do is uh, I'm just going to check in with everybody and just see if anybody has anything they, they particularly want to talk about today. So, Jake, um, anything for you today? No, nothing for me, Rick. Okay. Thibaut, are you still with us or are those kids making you crazy? He dropped off. Oh, he dropped off. Okay. Yeah. So hopefully he'll be back. Thibaut has two little boys. Um, so um, sometimes he, his caregiving gets in the way. Um, Dennis, anything for you? Yeah, I'll need a couple of minutes. Okay. Um, Mike Tamales, I know we've got some stuff to talk to you about, yes? Yeah. Okay. We'll get back to you. Bill, anything? Nothing for me. Nothing for me, Rick. Nothing for you. Okay. Well, I mean, I mean if you want me to talk about you know, the, the last couple of days, I, I'm not sure well, I, how useful it would be. I do. I mean, I'd like I'd like you to just fill us in on what's going on with this pain management and, 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 and this sure. management that you're asking. Okay. Yeah? Okay. That should, that, that should go quickly. Okay. Okay. Paul Frieda, how about you? 
Nothing for me tonight, thanks. Okay. Gary, anything for you? No, I'm just listening in today. Okay, we've got a quiet bunch today. Um, Steve, anything for you? Uh, I, I, I talk very briefly about uh, my experience on resuming the uh, Radium 223. So just a few minutes. Super. Um, Larry Fish, anything for you? Uh, nothing special today. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. I hope you can hear us. Okay. Yeah, I can hear you guys. And nothing tonight. Okay. Just listen, listening in. Okay, great. Um, and I see a familiar face we haven't seen in a few weeks. Mr. Van Zandt. How's life down in uh, Pennsylvania? Oh, uh, hanging in there. Good. Good. You want to finish uh, in? If we, if we slot you in for a few minutes so you can tell us what's been going on. All right. Okay. Thank you. All right. So let me just, um, I'll just run down, make sure I got everybody. If I didn't, you'll, you'll shout and then we'll, we'll, we'll kick off. So right now I'm aware of Jake, um, Tebow, maybe, um, Dennis Correa, Mike Tamales, Bill Burhans, Paul Frieda, uh, Spokane Gary, um, Dr. Steve, Larry Fish, and Tom Van Zandt. Did I miss anybody? Good. Okay, Dennis, the floor is yours. Take it away. Okay, just want to let everyone know I am scheduled tomorrow to meet with a genetic uh, test counselor at the uh, University of Arizona Cancer Center. Okay. And uh, kind of been doing my homework on this thing prior to our meeting and I I did uh find some information relative to my my uh family heritage is is all uh comes from Portugal and uh I'm first generation here in the States. Uh and I looked I found a study that had been done I think a couple of years ago in Portugal about this uh Hox B13, I believe is the uh, the gene uh, that they have found uh, shows some prevalence there uh, in a study that they did uh, from all areas of Portugal. So that's one thing I'm probably going to ask some questions about. And if there's anything, any other intelligent questions that I should be asking of the counselor. I think she's going to be doing most of the question asking about my uh, background and family history on this prostate cancer, which unfortunately, because of the uh, the, uh, the, the the death of everyone uh, in my family that would have been related, uh, there's uh, no help of getting uh, this medical record or death. I did find one of my father's brother uh, did die from prostate cancer um, and that was back uh, he was 60 69 when he died that was his cause of death and my father's cause of death was lung cancer uh, primarily I think due to smoking but and he died at uh, age 61 and I think uh, he may have had prostate cancer but just not was not diagnosed and it wasn't his his cause of death but other than that, I had no siblings to uh, to look to to check with their experience or anything. So I thought the next closest thing would be just the uh, the general heritage, and if there was anything that was uh, unique to uh, the Portuguese uh, background and heritage there that could have uh, shown a yeah. indication of. <laughs> We should probably share with Anne that we are really, really fortunate that that, that we have Professor Bill Burhans as one of our group because Bill is um, is a genetic cancer uh, uh, cancer researcher at Roswell Park, which was is one of the NCCN hospitals. And I'm going to allow Bill to share his story briefly with you when he talks a little bit later. Um, but Bill. Um, what do we know about Hoxby 13? Is that is that should that be on our radar? 
I don't know. It hasn't been on my radar, but that may be because my radar has been shut down for much of the time over the last uh, few months. But um, I would certainly raise that issue with him, as you said you plan to do. Do you know um, what organization or company they're planning to send your DNA to? For I do not, and I think that that would be a question. I know Foundation One Medicine has been mentioned many times on our call here, and that's in my in my mind as prevalent. Uh, I don't. To go to. I don't think the Foundation One does germline sequencing. I think they're focused on uh, sequencing DNA from tumor cells. Okay. There, there are a number of other organizations though that do um, uh, sequence germline DNA. The, the company that sequenced my DNA was called Embry Genetics. And um, some of them are better or worse at doing this. And so it's you know important that you get hooked up with a company that does a good job. So why don't you, um, after your meeting, why don't you shoot me an email and let me know what the answer to that question is. And I can do okay. what I want to And if you have any choice in the matter, I would highly recommend Ambry, um, both in terms of you know my experience with them, and also because they um, you know th these these uh, companies don't sequence your entire genome. They're sequencing a subset of genes that have been implicated in prostate cancer. And uh, there are different genes that fall in, that are uh, sequenced by different groups. Embry has a fairly comprehensive set of genes. I mean, all of them uh, sequence the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes. Uh, so, you know, that's how I found out that I was positive for a mutation in BRCA2. But uh, it, it, Embry will also sequence about, uh, the last time I checked, it was about 30 other genes. You want to make sure that there's a significant number of genes that they're uh, going to be looking at. Otherwise, they might miss something. And you, you know, and if you're interested in Hox B genes, then, um, you know, certainly you want to make sure that they're uh, going to be sequencing those. Right. How do you spell that? Is that Embry, E-M-B-R-Y? A-M-B-R-Y, M as in Mary, B-R-Y. So Bill, okay, got it. Bill, one, one, and I'm not really sure if this, we said that uh, Foundation One, uh, when I had the Foundation ACT testing, which is circulating DNA, they did do germ cell, BRCA, BRCA1 and 2 on me using uh, the liquid biopsy and not tissue. I had previously had germ cell as well, but this was on tumor DNA. So I, I do think they do it. Okay, good. I wasn't aware of that. Yeah. They, I, I, I can clarify a little bit. They, they don't actually do germline um, in terms of uh, from saliva. Um, they may do it from blood, but the problem from blood is that you're looking for sufficient number of circulating tumor cells, so you may not get a result. Whereas it seems like generally, and Bill, you can explain this, the germline from a saliva test, they have enough um, cells to be able to figure your germline. But, but uh, Rick, this, I'm not talking CTCs, I'm talking about circulating tumor DNA, free DNA from the tumor. So that would look at both germ cell and somatic mutations right, of, of the BRCA nature. But yeah, I think you it, there, there's going to be some of both circulating yeah. in your uh, circulatory system. And so they would know uh, if, if they see wild type genes showing up in addition to mutant genes for any particular gene, then uh, they can definitively say that that's coming from the, you know, that that's a germline mutation. Um, whereas if they don't see it, then um, they know that it's, you know, that it, uh, if they if they see constantly a mutation in all the DNA, then that would mean that it is a germline mutation. 
Yeah, I hope yeah. I'm clear. Yeah, yeah, yes. Okay. So, um, what questions, Bill, would you recommend that that um, that Dennis asks the genetic counselor tomorrow? In in addition to ascertaining where uh, he's, they're going to send the sample. Um, let me think about this for a moment. Uh, I, I think those are the probably the most important ones. I mean, ask, I would ask whatever the company is, I would ask what their reputation is. Uh, it may not be a company that I'm familiar with, but, you know, I think the most important thing is that they're sending it to a company that um, really knows what they're doing. There are a lot of, uh, not fly by night, but there are a lot of clinicians that are getting into this business of, of uh, testing, of genetic testing. And, and they don't have the genetic experience all the time to be able to do it properly. So for example, some hospitals uh, will offer this to their patients now and um, the quality of the, uh, of the uh, results is debatable. So um, I think that's the most important question is to make sure that it's going to be done by um, someone that is, uh, you know, an organization that's really good at it. I think it's also going to be important to um, have them interpret the results for you clearly and explain to you what they mean. And, you know, there are mutations that occur that have no effect on the function of the proteins or the genes um, uh, that in, that where the mutations occur. And uh, there are other mutations that are pathogenic. So you're, you know, they're, they're going to know that and they're probably going to distinguish between those two possibilities. Um, you are probably going to uh, want to ask them about the, um, the, the consequences of the results for your family if it's positive for a germline mutation. So if you have kids and it turns out that you have, for example, a mutation in a BRCA gene, then that's something that your children um, your adult children would uh, need to know. And if you have younger children, they eventually would, would need to know, although not for a number of years. Um, so uh, that's something else that you should speak to them about. Yeah, um, my, my purpose here is, is actually is twofold. It's just as you mentioned, I do have two daughters that are in their 40s. And uh, so I'd like to know whether I am carrying uh, anything that would have, have an impact on them. And then also for my uh, treatment down the road here uh, is, is the primary other purpose for it, secondary reason for it. But so that is on my agenda. Right. So with regard to the last one, you're going to want to know what they recommend. I mean, they should, if it's a, if it's a, a uh, competent company, they should be able to tell you, uh, you know, what drugs, if, if there are hits, meaning uh, mutations in genes that promote cancer and that are known to uh, where the mutations are considered to be pathogenic, you're going to want to know what drugs might be available that would specifically target those genes. That should be in the genetics report that they give you, but I would, you know, ask uh, your doctor to make sure that that information is going to be available. Just, just one other thing to share with everybody, which I've just learned recently, is that Foundation Medicine has a service um, where if you provide them your genetic analysis, they will tell you what... Um, clinical trials are available to you throughout the country. I'm not sure if it includes Europe or not, it may do. I'd have to check with David Marshak. But, um, but we found out about this because Eric um, was at a meeting recently in, um, in San Francisco 
and he got a Foundation Medicine report, and so I reached out to Foundation Medicine, and they told me, yes, this is a service, they don't publicize it heavily, but if anybody, if any of our guys are interested, and we send them the genetic information, they'll, they'll send back a report indicating what clinical trials um, might be available. So does anybody, um, anybody else on the call, has anyone else on the call done germline testing? And um, or have any other input they'd like to, to 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 pass on to Dennis for his meeting tomorrow? Bill, uh, when you talked about this before, and this was something that was a little confusing to me until you actually talked about it. There's both. There's when you look at BRCA, there's germline, and then there's somatic somatic mutations of cells that are BRCA one and two. Right. And primarily tumor tissue, and and those may be amenable to a laparate and PARP inhibitor. So, uh, I guess when I first had germline testing, I just had basically a blood test by the genetics lab from the from Kaiser, where I get my care, and they said, "Well, you're negative, so good thing for your kids." But they can also show that mutation in somatic tumor tissue as well, and presumably circulating DNA from that tissue. And uh, that may be amenable to uh, treatment. So it's important to, to do that testing, I think, rather than just do the blood test and say you're, you're not germ cell positive, then that's that. I agree, yeah. So uh, yeah. not all companies do the somatic cell testing or are equipped to do, uh, you know, to capture circulating tumor cell DNA. But um, that would be another consideration, I think, if I were so Ambry Genetics, you know, did uh, without doing uh, looking for circulating tumor cell DNA um, or doing a biopsy, you wouldn't have the appropriate material. Yeah. And uh, when I was tested just a few years ago, circulating, uh, uh, I'm I'm sorry, I, I'm misspeaking there. Circulating tumor, uh, yeah, no, I'm not circulating tumor cell DNA. Uh, tests were not available. It wasn't technically possible to uh, capture that DNA. But um, if the company that your DNA is going to be sent to can get that information too by either capturing circulating tumor cell DNA or doing a biopsy, then uh, yeah, I agree that would be really important. Because even if you're negative for a mutation in your germline, very often mutations in these pathways arise in uh, tumor cells, and that makes them equally as actionable as would be a uh, germline mutation. So again, the thing that, for those of you who are just um, who are a little lost here, and we've talked about it a bunch of times, you have to make the difference between the germline mutation, which is an inherited mutation, um, through your, um, through your ancestors. Um, a mutation that came, that, that essentially you were born with. And most of the time when we talk um, genetic testing, that's what most people are referring to. Not everybody, but most people. Subsequent to that, you can create these mutations within your own body. And the cancer itself can morph and mutate. And that is not a mutation that came from your parents. Right. So that's what we right. call somatic testing. And those right. that is generally done either by taking a solid tumor sample or a liquid tumor sample. These are the circulating tumor cells we've been talking about but not from saliva, which is often used for germline testing, inherited testing. And what Dennis is doing tomorrow is the inherited test. And down the road, if it's necessary, you know, we'll talk about doing the somatic test. What Foundation Medicine generally does, not always, as you've heard, because there are some exceptions, especially with the BRCA gene, but they mostly do somatic testing. In other words, they are analyzing a sample either from a circulating tumor cell or from 
a solid tumor cell, from a solid tumor cell. Let me, let me just say too that there are two sources of tumor cell DNA. It sounds like uh, the first one is just free DNA that's floating in the bloodstream that's released from tumor cells when they lice. And then there's also DNA that's uh, in tumor cells that are circulating in the bloodstream. And those cells are first captured uh, by using antigenic markers. And then, then the DNA is isolated in the, uh, in the in sequence. So I think, um, Steve, it sounds like the test that you had was of uh, involved capturing uh, DNA after it had been released from cells. Is that correct? It was both CTCs and free floating or free DNA released oh. from cells as well. Both. Um, both. That's what we do with this Foundation Act. Um, uh, one other thing, just very quickly, because Rick, you probably want to leave this most erudite discussion here, uh, <laughs> which is probably getting over my head as well. But but I, I do think that uh, uh, Dennis, for your sake, you don't need to be an expert on this. The genetics people that you're going to need to be the experts, and all you need to do is say, what do I have, and is it actionable? Is there something right. to do about it? You don't need to know every in and out of every gene mutation. You just need to ask, do I have something that you can do something about? And that's called actionable. Right. right. Thanks. To you. <laughs> okay. And again, for anzidification, uh, Steve has advanced prostate cancer, but is also a, uh, a retired OBGYN um, who's dealt with a lot of cancer over his life. And there's also, and you'll find this interesting, <laughs> literally one of the innovators of, of uh, medical databases. In, in Steve is an expert, a nationally recognized expert in medical databases. So, again, we're really lucky that he's a regular on our board. I'm used to dealing with other people's cancers, however, not my own. <laughs> it's quite different when it's your own. Yeah, God help his doctors. As, as, uh, you know, it was that the discussion about how to deal with your doctor was kind of interesting. I, I've got them well trained, believe me. <laughs> Um, so let's move on. And um, Mike Tamales, are you there? I'm here. Okay. So what we heard, what before Peter went away, is that you were about to meet with your relatively new medical oncologist, and he was going to come up with a new um treatment mode for you you want to tell us what's going on with your with your prostate cancer and where you are with that doc well that uh, that appointment's going to be on the 4th of august okay and so um uh, the extendy doesn't look like it's working and so it um I think uh, he's leaning towards um, chemo chemotherapy and doing the docetaxel stuff. Um, uh, yeah, that's that's. I go in and see him on the fourth, so that, that's that's where I am right now. My my PSA is at like 471. Last check. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, I'm starting to get a little more sore. That's why I kind of know it's not working. Um, and so I'm just kind of wondering if anybody on the call has any experience with docetaxel. We do, and 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 we'll, we'll we'll move to that momentarily. But just let me ask you a couple of questions, Mike. So. In my own notes, I see that your PSA was in the in the 80s, uh, back at the beginning of the year. So you're saying that it, it's 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 really gone up significantly um, over the last two or three months to 471. Yeah, that's that's almost uh, about a month ago. Reading too, yeah. I'm gonna get another. Uh, I'll be able to. If 
find out what it is tomorrow because I'm going to go get an Exchiva shot. And then uh, they have my my uh, PSA over there too, but I'm sure it's gone up. And what was your last PSA before the 471? Um, that I have to look up. I don't, I don't have it in front of me. Okay. You, 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 you know how quickly you're doubling? Yeah. It, it, it's, it, yeah, it's been doubling. It was, or it was doubling before that. Okay. You, are you doubling like every month at this point? I don't know. I'll find out tomorrow um, when I when I go uh, when I when I go in for uh, my shot. Um, yeah, I actually do see it here that in May May you were at 382, so now you're at 4, 471, probably in June or something like that. So you know, it sort of gives us a feel, and yeah, it's clear the extend is not working, and um, you really are, um, are looking for some experience on, on, um, those attacks or, um, so I'm going to ask Steve to, to address that. I'm looking to see who else on the call has been, oh, and Larry Fish. So we have a couple of guys who have, who have done those attacks on the call tonight. And, and so they can share with you. Um, What's your feeling about dose attacks, or what's your feeling about going on on chemo at this point? Me? Uh, I, I don't want to do it. I'm digging my heels in. Uh, back to the ABC, anything but chemo, but um, um, kind of running out of options here, so, um, and uh, uh, you've been sitting. You know, I'm, 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 of, I'm of that of the mindset. Like everybody, oh, well, doctor knows best. Yeah. So I, I really haven't haven't questioned it or. Um, well, Peter's or, Peter's questioned it. I mean, when you've been to your meetings along with Peter, he's he's. He sat there and questioned the doctors, I think. At least yeah. that's what he's told us. Yeah. Um, have you, I, I know that they sent off a sample for you to Foundation Medicine a few months ago and there was nothing actionable. Have you talked about doing that again with a solid tumor sample? Uh, no. I mean, there is new research that just came, that was just published last month that, that there really shouldn't be a significant difference between a, a blood sample, a circulating tumor sample, and a solid sample. Um, but with your cancer moving as quickly as it is, it's probably worth getting sequenced again with whatever they can use to sequence you, um, it might be good to to raise that with, um, what's his name, o Okusaki, is it, Dr. Okusaki? Yes, yes. Yeah, so it might be a good idea to raise that. But let, let me go to, um, first to Steve and then to Larry Fish. Or Actually, let's go to Larry Fish first, because he hasn't spoken yet, and then we'll go to Steve. Larry. Um, a man who's considering going on dose attacks, what would you want to say to him? Well, I don't know if I'm the best person to speak about this. You know, I was uh, I was on dose attacks so only only for um, I guess only for three, uh, only for uh, nine, ten, nine, twelve weeks, mm -hmm. because I was sort of out of I was on the early, the Lupron plus doxetoxel early intervention, but I was out of the original, you know, was out of the original stampede trials. I was out of 
the original range of the first four months of diagnosis. So when I started to get uh, unpleasant side effects, they said, well, you might, you could stop since we don't really know if you're in a, if this is the effective time for you to be on the, the dox, docetaxel. Since the Lupron is working, your PSA has really dropped to, really dropped to point, zero point whatever. Uh, you can stop it because we don't know if there was, there's no specific evidence or no protocol for you to be on it at this point because I was already out of the range of the time the, for the suggestion to start taking it together with Lupron, which was in the... How did you manage, and they, how did you manage the, the, the dose of Taxel for the three sessions you were on? What would you, what would you, how would you counsel Mike? And so the, the, I started to get these bad side effects on the, after the third session, bad skin effects. And I saw my doctor and he said, well, go see someone at Sloan. And they said, well, since you're out, since there's no way to know, you're not part of any study to show that there's any specific advantage, mm -hmm. uh, you know, probably you, while we just suggest you might as well stop. And then later on, when you become castrate resistant and you go through abiraterone or Rextandi and then you know you're, it's available for you to try it again. So, so I'm not really somebody that can speak about what happens from a full course. So I don't want to be discouraging or encouraging. Uh, I just wonder. I had a question, Mike. Did you ever try uh, abiraterone or just just uh, Xtandi? Did you ever try enzalutamide? Or oh, I know yeah. that they tend. You did, yeah. Uh, enzalutamide is extandy. Right. I mean abiraterone. Yeah. Um, you did that first? No, I don't think I've done that one. Uh, Zytiga, I mean. Oh, Zytiga. Okay, yeah, I've done Zytiga. You did. So I was wondering just as sometimes I see now they have these new trials where they're combining extandy with uh, Keytruda. Mm -hmm. um, just things like that, that if your doctor has looked into, is there anything possible? Usually that's not going to be applicable for you probably because uh, they'd want you to be na naive to those drugs. Well, Larry, that's one of the reasons why I think it would be good to get sequenced again. Because if, if, if we were to find an actionable gene, it would indicate whether one of these newer drugs like nivolumab or, or pembrolizumab would, would be effective rather than just sort of taking a shot in the dark. Yeah, well, of course, I'm not a doctor. I don't know what shot in the dark to take. And... Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's, that's... <laughs> Dennis, what, how about, how about you? How did, how, I, I know you, you had a little bit of difficulty after, but overall your experience wasn't too bad on, on docetaxel, wasn't it? Is that true? Yeah, I can, I can say it wasn't too bad after it's over. <laughs> going going through it, as you know, was uh, I guess just probably more of a discomfort. And other than my short, brief hospital stay, be, because of my white blood cell count going way down, that I had to get treated for the blood clots and that kind of thing. But it got managed. Uh, you know, when you when if you do start to have severe side effects and you, you got to get attention pretty quickly it's not something to, to mess around with and just try to uh in, endure it uh but the side effects i had was other than being very tired and in, in the cycles depending upon when you get your your dose taxol infusions uh generally they give you some uh steroids to help with that uh for the few days before and after you start taking that. It helps you get through the infusion part of it. And you actually feel okay when I mean, you go home from the infusion. Fine. And about five days later, you start to you head downhill and you get get tired and uh, you have uh, difficulty, a little difficulty eating. Nothing really tastes good. And I actually got a lot of uh, bloating and stuff. I think it was caused by that. This was also combined with. Uh, I first started, I was on Firmagon when I first started getting a dose taxol 
to prevent the tumor flare. And that worked good for me. And then they switched me to the Lupron uh, after I think it was a couple months. I forgot exactly when it was. But this was a year ago now I, when I finished my 18 weeks of it. And you know, I, I have to say, other than feeling maybe older than what I felt before I started this whole process, uh, I'm pretty much doing, you know, we're just about anything I would like to do right now. I, they resolved the blood clotting, so I don't need to take the blood thinners anymore. I'm just, just getting my loop on every three months um, and deal with the side effects from that. But the, the dose taxol, uh, they did, the other thing they did for me uh, when I ended up in the hospital, they reduced the dose. And uh, I was concerned about that. Uh, gee, am I going to get the full effect of this thing because I had to reduce my dose? But uh, I dropped my PSA from a high of, I believe it was 17, down to like 0.66. So it was effective. Uh, PSA is climbing back up again naturally. Uh, so I will be looking at something further down the line. But at that point in time, I think it did the trick for me. So Mike, we're, we're, we're working. We're working from the worst to the best because now I get to talk to the poster boy who won, who won his tennis tournament between his fifth and his sixth infusion. So Steve, go on. Let, let yeah, it was. You know, I was playing against a bunch of octogenarians. You know, at this condo complex. So I'm not sure. I did. I did win a tennis tournament down in Palm Springs, but um, <clears throat> I'm not sure that this was not the U.S. Open exactly. Uh, anyway. Um, nor was it Wimbledon. <laughs> um, you know, you know. I think that what everyone said is accurate. I, you know, I had six cycles. Uh, you know, in basically in keeping with the Stampede trials, and uh, I was within the 120 days of, of starting on the uh, androgen deprivation. So I was, and this was no longer a clinical trial. Uh, so I, at that time, which is now, I ended it a year and almost a year and a half ago now. Um, that was what you did, you know, pretty much. You were diagnosed with advanced cancer, and you went on uh, androgen deprivation, and you added docetaxel for six cycles. Um, I got through it okay. I, I must say uh, I'm still eating fruit popsicles because they're so they tasted so good then, and they still taste good, you know. <laughs> I just told my wife, Maureen, pick up some more fruit popsicles, you know. I think I'm addicted to those. <laughs> no meat anyway, but, uh, you know, uh, my hair fell out. Uh, I don't know. My nails kind of it's kind of strange, uh, but other than that, I, I can't say. Uh, you know, my my white counts dropped somewhat. I did take. I, I was going on a trip for four weeks to to London and then to Ireland actually, and uh, my uh, absolute neutral count would drop down to about a thousand. So I did take some uh, Nubigen, uh twice right before I left on that trip uh, for a low white count, but it, it, it never dropped below a thousand on the the A and C, the absolute neutrophil count. So uh, I did okay. I mean, I wouldn't want to take it again. Uh, I, I hear you, you know, anything but chemo, ABC. Uh, and I do think there are a couple of things you might consider. If you failed both abiraterone and enzalutamide, uh, there, there is a trial where they're taking them together because there's populations of cells that may respond to either one or the other, but you'd have to have superb insurance to, to justify that because now you're talking you know, twenty thousand dollars worth of drugs a month, basically. And the other thing is the Sam Denmead's uh, work with the uh, bipolar androgen therapy. I mean, you'd be a great candidate for that. Um, if you don't want to take chemo, you might give that a month or two and see if that does work. He talked at one of our seminars, Rick, as you know. Um, that's something that a lot of oncologists are sort of poo-pooing, but you know, he's getting some success with that as well. So if you're really trying to just save chemo, and then there's Jebtana. You could take carboxytaxel as well, so it may have fewer side effects. Um, they usually reserve that for somebody that's been on docetaxel, but if you really don't want to go on docetaxel, you could try Jebtana, which is chemo, but it might be a little bit uh, better tolerated by you as well if your doc's willing to give you that. Um, but I, I wouldn't enjoy going back on it, I can tell you that right now, even having won that tennis tournament. Hello. Although we should mention it took your PSA down from a thousand and something to to eight, right? Yeah, I did. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so, Mike, uh, 
I, I assume, I shouldn't assume, are you going to this appointment with Okazaki on your own? Is your wife going with you? Or is anyone else accompanying you? Um, my wife is going. Um, um, no, nobody else. I think what you, you know, what you, as you know from Peter going with you, it's good to have your questions written down. And I think there are maybe two or three questions that you want to write, to make a note of, to ask, and to hand to the doctor. First of all, I think that you might make sure he knows how sensitive you are to drugs because you may be a candidate to start with with a reduced dose just to see how you handle it and then to titrate up the dose. You know, we're not docs, we don't give medical advice, but we watch you, we see you, we know what a tough time you've had with drugs over the last two years. And it's something you may, need to make sure Okazaki is aware of because you've only been seeing him for a few months. And he can make the decision but it's worth talking to him about, Doc, do you think maybe I should start off on a lower dose? Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing is that, um, as Steve points out, the Jeftana or the Cabazitaxel might be an option for you because you don't tolerate drugs so well. And that's something you should discuss with him and just ask him what he thinks about that. And the third thing is, and I think it's an excellent point on Steve's behalf to definitely consider the bipolar androgen therapy, the BAT. If Dr. Okazaki is not familiar with it, he can watch the presentation Sam Demme made to us back in February, which is he can find on, on our website, on answercancer.org. There's a page there. He can go in. He can watch it. And, you know, I I... I I'm not embarrassed to refer it to him. It, it was patient centric, but it was it was detailed and scientific enough that I think a doctor that isn't familiar with BAT would, would get a lot out of it. So I think three things there that um, for you to make a note of and write them down. Be sure to hand them to him. Make notes, ask him if you can record the call so you can listen to it later and you can share it with one of us. I'm not sure when Peter's back stateside, but I think it's sometime soon after you're done. And, you know, let, uh, you're right, something has to be done. Um, likely chemo, but possibly not chemo. Any anyone else want to say anything to Mike? Um, and um, before I go back to Mike for the final word, well, I, I think you know, looking at clinical trials, there's some clinical trials that might be available, but you know, location-wise, uh, might be difficult to travel to some of those. So there certainly are some clinical trials that might might work, uh, but I don't know if you have to be chemotherapy naive. Or you can be chemotherapy naive to participate in some of these, like the lutetium trial, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't know. But clinical trials, well, even the BAT is a clinical trial. And if your oncologist, you know, says, well, I don't do that, I'm not familiar with it, you know, just Google Sam Denmi and have him call him doctor to doctor to talk about it. That's very commonly done. And it's nothing that if your oncologist says, no, nah, I don't want to call him, I, I would say, you know what, I would like you to call him because I, I do think he uh, his presentation uh, was very impressive. And he also said that he'd be happy to talk to any doctor, to the doctor, <laughs> any that are on, um, you know, that are part of answer cancer. Um, thanks, Steve. Any Anyone else want to say anything to, to Mike? Um, or Mike, would you like to say to, to close out before before we move on? Uh, no, I just uh, like to thank the guys for their input. A pleasure. Um, yeah, thanks, guys. A pleasure. Let us know. 
after the appointment. Let us know what happens, my uh, what happens, Mike. Okay. Um, somebody else has joined us on the telephone. Um, would you, are you comfortable to identify who you are? Yeah, Rick, this is Bill Franklin. I dialed in after I uh, got done with my other thing. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, okay, did you need any time tonight, Bill? Nope, no, I've been listening for about the last 40 minutes. Uh, I don't need anything. I'm good. Great. Okay, let's, mo let's move on to Professor Bill. Um, I know Bill has an update for us on his pain management. And maybe you just want to tell Anne a little bit about your background because it's so incredible and fascinating. So uh, I'm not sure about that, but I'm a, uh, a uh, cancer scientist, as Rick said earlier. I, I've been uh, working at uh, Russell Park Cancer Institute in, in uh, Buffalo, New York for about 25 years. And I uh, studied DNA replication and DNA repair pathways. And uh, about four years ago, I was diagnosed with a, a pathogenic mutation in the BRCA2 gene, which is uh, involved in uh, repairing DNA, a DNA replication fork. So it's uh, um, involved in making sure that DNA replication is accurate. Um, it's uh, um, what else can I tell you? Um, the uh, uh, oh yeah, sorry, I'm 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 pretty sleepy tonight for some reason. I'm really not with it mentally. So uh, I am being treated with a PARP inhibitor. I, are you familiar with those? And yeah. So uh, that began about two years ago. And um, it's been, it, it was something that my doctors were not familiar with, but because of my background in DNA replication, I was. I had actually written a book chapter about 10 years ago predicting that it would be useful in the clinic, but not for prostate cancer so much as ovarian and uh, breast cancer. And uh, it has, as you know, become clear that it's involved mutations in BRCA genes also promote prostate cancer. So um, two years ago, I began treatment with, with uh, uh, Olaparib, the first generation PARP inhibitor, and it's been working spectacularly well. I had a number of lesions in my spine and ribs, and most of them are gone. There's just one, uh, there are just two left and one is shrinking. And I'm uh, not asymptomatic at this point. Um, but my, the larger problem for me has been uh, pain due to uh, radiation. So one of the, I, I did not uh, undergo a radical prostatectomy, but uh, rather I went through radiation and because of my mutation status, I think um, that mutation in that particular gene makes me radiosensitive, meaning I'm, you know, normal cells are sensitive, uh, can be damaged more easily by radiation than uh, a patient that doesn't have that mutation. And so that's caused quite a few problems down in my pelvic region. And I, uh, received a intrathecal pain pump uh, which, which was installed in underneath my uh, skin about uh, three months ago two months ago in april and um and that the idea of this pump is that it uh, provides a much reduced amount of narcotics to handle pain pumped directly into the spinal cord then would be then the, at that point I was taking large amounts of of uh, oral narcotics and the idea was to get off the oral narcotics so um, it that also worked spectacularly well although um, it I needed to build up my strength quite a bit the the uh, 
Yeah, I think that bathing the nerves that run down my legs cause some problems in terms of weakness of those of uh, my legs, but I've solved that with exercise. And uh, but the pain by you know when I woke up from the surgery to install the pump, it, the pain was gone. But at, so then I began to back off on the drugs, the oral drugs, and the last one was methadone. And I was, uh, I stopped taking methadone a couple days ago, um, right around the time that Rick was here visiting me. And, uh, and within a day, I began to experience quite a bit of discomfort again, which I initially attributed to Rick uh, keeping me really busy and doing <laughs> lots of things like hiking up the hills around here. But then on Saturday, it occurred to me that it was probably because I wasn't taking an oral narcotic at all. And the people in the, uh, my doctors in the pain clinic where I work, uh, put me back on methadone and that solved the problem almost immediately. Um, so I will, the plan is to assess things in another couple of weeks when I get back to my hometown but I probably will stay on this much lower level of uh, oral pain medication in combination with the uh, medication that's being delivered by the intrathecal pain pump for good. So, um, so it's, it's, uh, you know, the, 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 you know, the, 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 the basic storyline here is that it has the pain pump has worked exceptionally well with a couple of glitches, including the one I had over the weekend. But I think that we've solved that problem. Uh, and what what Bill failed to tell you was that, and I think I have this right, that he actually got diagnosed with the prostate cancer that was largely metastasized before he knew it was BRCA positive. And then it was his idea that the docs used this drug that he'd been working on, this PARP inhibitor he'd been working on for 20 odd years. And he said, because they didn't know anything about it. And Bill said, you know, I think this is a good idea. I think I should be taking this drug. So they said, okay, let's try it. And that's what happened. And it melted, uh, it melted the metastasis away. Is that a fair summary, Professor? Yeah, I didn't actually work directly on this drug. I worked on the genetic pathways that it operates on. And so that made me really familiar with it. Um, but And I had promoted it in the papers that I was writing, um, you know, based on preclinical studies. Um, but yeah, the, other than that, that's the, the gist of what Rick just said. Yeah, I did. I, I actually had to tell my oncologist he asked me how to spell it before uh, we wrote a letter to the insurance company uh, requesting permit, uh, asking that they pay for it, which fortunately they did. It's an extremely expensive drug. And you you probably know Alan Ashworth from from your days when you were uh, working with breast cancer. The name is vaguely familiar. Yes. <laughs> So Alan is now the um, head of the can of cancer research at UCSF, and I know him. A, I don't know him well, but I, I know him well enough. And um, this is a story that, uh, of course, BRCA and PARP inhibitors are near and dear to Alan's heart. And this is a story that I've told him because it's such a good, it's such a great story with with a what we hope is going to be a really good ending. So. Um, so, Bill, are you saying that this methadone um, you think is going to be ongoing um, or, or are you going to have the opportunity to titrate off it, um, maybe if you stop it more? Bit, I did. It might make more the, uh, the doctor, the attending physician that is following me in the pain clinic told me on the phone the other night that uh, I probably would remain on it for good. But I think I'm going to ask that we 
uh, try to increase the uh, amount of narcotics that's being delivered by the pump mm -hmm. the next time you see him mm -hmm. instead of increasing, instead of remaining on the oral narcotics with the idea that, um, you know, because it's not being systemically delivered, I'm not going to be as fuzzy brain for one thing. And, uh, you know, and, and uh, uh, well, for that, that's the, the biggest region, reason. But, um, you know, on the flip side, if going up on the drugs that are being delivered by the pump causes problems with my legs again, then I'm going to want to, I'd much rather have the function of my legs and I'll stick with the oral uh, medication. It's a very even, you know, so the, the amount that I'm on now that's successfully managing my pain, the amount of oral methadone is uh, quite small compared to, it's just a small fraction of what I had been taking uh, before I had uh, the pump installed. Bill, what are, Bill they, what are they giving you via the pump? Is it morphine or? I'm, uh, the pump is delivering Dilaudid and uh, Bupivacaine and a drug called clonidine, which um, as far as I can tell is mostly used for horses. <laughs> okay. Clonidine is an antihypertensive actually, but it's used for nerve pain as well. Yeah, and, and uh, hypotension was a big problem for me after the, right after the pump was installed. Um, I, I had, uh, it was difficult to stand up without crashing to the floor, but um, it, but that uh, that problem seems to have uh, disappeared. In, oh, interesting. We, we reduce it. I forgot to say we reduce the amount of clonidine for that reason. You know, clonidine, I, I used to hand it out like water because it is off-label use for hot flashes for menopausal women in low dosages. It works great for that. And so I used to use it all the time for uh, off-label for in low dosages for hot flashes. Really? really? That's interesting. That is interesting. You said, you said Dilaudid, and what was the other one? Uh, clonidine. Clonidine. And in bupivacaine. Bupivacaine. I never heard of that one. It's a local anesthetic, oh. like bupivacaine. Oh, it's okay. A local anesthetic. Okay, the cane should have been the clue. Thank you. And and Steve, yeah. so which was the drug you used for um, for handling hot flashes? Clonidine. Clonidine. Okay. Yeah, the same stuff he's getting in his infusion because yeah. it's used for nerve pain. But uh, uh, I forget the dosage. I would try two milligrams or something. If I forget. But it, it was very effective. It worked. I had hundreds of women on it. Maybe it's something. Maybe it's something we need to talk to some of these guys about who are having a really tough time when they go on Lupron with hot flashes. Yeah, absolutely. That's why. That's the. That's the irony of it. Is it might be effective for Lupron related or Firmagon related hot flashes. Yeah. But nobody's ever talked about it or tried it. So. Yeah, I mean, you know. The, well, but it, it, I was interested to hear what you had to say because I recently went back on enzalutamide um, because my, my PSA began to creep up. So I think the the olaparib is uh, beginning to lose its effectiveness, which is not surprising given the type of mutation that I have. Um, and, uh, and now I'm having hot flashes again for the first time in a couple of years. Um, but I am not going to ask for more quantity no. Yeah, there's no. I, I'm going to try to avoid having an increase in the pump medication as, as much as I can. It really uh, took me off my feet for a couple of months. Bill, eat umami, which is soy, soybeans. Uh, yeah. You know, have you tried that? That's another yeah. black cohosh, you know, like black cohosh tea. Eat umami has uh, been used, any type of soy product, but in particular, eat umami has. A tremendous amount of phytoestrogens, which are very effective for hot flashes. So I, I, uh, I just, when I was having hot flashes with Lupron, which I, I really don't have much anymore, I was eating, uh, you know, bowls full of edamame. <laughs> I like it. Thanks. I like That's it. a good suggestion. Yeah, I'll, I'll try that. It's, it's a great suggestion. I mean, 
the the drug i'm trying to remember the one that eric small recommended to me um but it has it has issues around it for hot flashes i think it begins with an m steve oh, it's just i'm having a senior moment i can't i can't think what it's called i've got to look it up um but you know there are cut there are oh um deeper Provera is another alternative that but some menu that has, its own, that has its own side effects. I wouldn't go on Depot Provera for hot flashes. You want to, I mean, hot flashes are annoying, whereas Depot Provera is potentially has dangerous side effects if given over a long period of time. So, to me, the, I've been on the Lupron now for uh, just shy of two years, and uh, the hot flashes do get better, I, I think. Yeah. yeah, they did for me until I went back on enzalutamide. I don't know if there's a connection there or. I'm sure there is. But yeah. yeah. Bill, I f I'm on enzalutamide now. This is Jake. And I yeah. found that uh, I, I keep getting new sensations with it, but they don't last, they go away. So chances are the hot flashes will get better for you as well. Yeah, they're not, they really aren't problematical at this yeah. point. It's not, uh, not n n they're nothing like they were uh, when I was. Uh, I'm still. I've been on on uh, Eligard, right? Uh, so another version of Luprolide uh, since I was diagnosed in 2013. And when I first went on it, the hot flashes were just unbelievable. The ones that I'm experiencing now are very minor compared to that, and not. You know, they don't impact me in terms of my ability to do things or. You may know, tell you one thing. You might notice you lose all your body hair, <clears throat> not your hair on your head, but your your like your arm hair and leg hair and. Well, yeah, that, that has happened. And okay. I don't know if you can see my photo. I think it's promoting hair on my head. Promoting <laughs> <laughs> the growth of hair on my head. They seem to grow fast. You save on razor blades, however, so that's good. You heard? I yeah. shave. Shave once a week or so, maybe not even that. Yeah, so I I don't shave once a week, but once every other day where I used to shave every every day. But have you noticed you've kind of gone bald on your legs and arms and everything? Oh yeah. Yep. Yeah. It's gone. I can live with that too. <laughs> I don't particularly care about that. But. Neither do I. Yeah. I, I the hot flashes got me pretty good. Tell you, and I was very um, grateful. I mean, I think that was probably one of the, the hot flashes and the fatigue were, were what nailed me the worst. So I was pretty glad to, to, to get them done with. Anyway, let's keep moving along here. Um, Steve, um, let me go to you and then to Tom Van Zandt. Um, what, um, give us a, you have the floor. There was something you wanted to say, so talk to us. Um, I, I've probably done enough talking. I'll defer to Tom, although he's not on the camera right now. So uh, I, I started back on the um, radium 223, the Zofigo, after I had stopped it after three doses. That was my own idea, saying that, gee, if you calculate an 11-day half-life and you give it monthly, you're going to have it in your system for quite a while. And so I decided to just take three and then uh, go on to something different, which was Provenge at that time, because... Uh, my uh, PSA was down pretty low, and I thought, well, if I'm ever going to do Provenge, I might as well do it now. So, and then I decided, uh, along with my my oncologist, um, to go back on it now with the rising PSA. It's gone from eight now to I don't know what the last one was 18.9, I think, like that, over about four or five months. Uh, and interestingly, um, I must say, uh, you know, I've been having some back pain, but you know, Motrin was okay. I'm not taking any narcotics. Uh, I did have an MRI, and there is an enhanced area in L45S1 that is no doubt tumor um, that's active. And so uh, now it's been two weeks tomorrow since the first, well, the fourth radium dose, but the the first one after my break of taking it uh, since September earlier. And I, I must say that the, the back pain is remarkably better. I, I played, uh, I played about three sets of tennis this morning, and, I, you know, I just was feeling really uh, stiff, you know, in the last few weeks, and I didn't feel that at all. 
I, I felt much more loose and I could really, you know, rotate a lot better and, uh, and as a result, uh, play a better game of tennis, which is very, very important to me, as you know, Rick. Um, so um, anyway, so uh, I do think it is improving things. So I'll take the other two dosages. And then uh, what I'm going to do after that, I'm not really sure. I'm going to go see Larry Fong formally in a, uh, an appointment to physically see him after I finish the radium and see if I can qualify for a uh, lutetium trial down at UCLA. I, that would be my next preference, uh, phase two lutetium. Uh, trial, but I'd like to get a, you know, a scan for staging with the PSMA gallium 68, but they, they don't want to do that at UCSF, and they only do it otherwise at UCLA around here in California. So, I, I, you know, I'm trying to kind of finagle my way into that as well to see if there's uh, something there on a PSMA gallium 68 uh, PET CT, which I'm convinced is uh, the the best scan. The Kaiser Permanente does offer a. Uh, What's called an axiomen scan, but uh, I think that's a vestigial branch on the main tree, frankly, in terms of PET scans. So, anyway, so that's my next uh, challenge here to try to convince my docs that I need it and they'll pay for it. Um, Steve, again, you know, we'd be happy to get that list of um, trials that are pertinent to you from from Foundation Medicine uh, if you send me. Your most recent report, I'll forward it on to David Marshak. They did. They sent it. I, I got it. And there, you know, it was the P10 and the CP53 uh, deletions were the mutations, and neither of them, uh, there was some evidence that Everolimus might be effective with the uh, P10 deletion, but th th there was nothing actionable, which only reinforced my oncologist's feeling that doing gene sequencing is basically a waste of money, um, which is unfortunate because I think. You know, if the oncologists don't believe it, it ain't going to fly. You know, those people got to order it. They'll change their mind with time. They will. Yeah, I hope so, because it sure uh, was important to me. No, I think uh, in situations like yours, Bill, but in general, I think as there's more drugs discovered for more mutations and more clinical trials, I think it's going to be increasingly important. I know I'm preaching to the choir here because Rick, you've been advocating it for years, but, but uh, you know, I, I must say it was my idea to get it done. And then when it was nothing actionable, it was like, well, I kind of told you it was really not going to be helpful. So there you go. Well, right. You know, we do know it's not a prize every time. Um, Foundation Medicine, I think, overstates. It's one of the things that does bother me. Um, but we, we, we talk about somewhere between 15 and 30 percent of men having actionable genes. I mean, I just had a um, I'm just going back and forth with Mike Scott on Prostate Cancer International right now um, because he still thinks gene sequencing um, should be confined to trials. And I just don't agree with him. Um, you know, I had mentioned it sort of came up in a discussion because I said to him that um, sometimes the pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical companies can be helpful in working with the insurance companies to get some of these drugs approved. And he was saying, well, that's a very slippery slope, which I acknowledge it is. Um, but if a man has an actionable gene and he can't get hold of that drug, it's not a great situation, and we should do whatever we can to help him get hold of that drug. And if that requires a pharmaceutical working with the insurance company, and there is the possibility of a conflict of interest, I acknowledge it. I'd rather deal with a conflict of interest than see a man suffer who doesn't need to suffer. And and you know we know that some of these new personalized medicines can be very effective for certain men. For example, Bill, perfect example. So when Mike Scott comes back and says to me, no, you know, I, I think we should only be dealing with this in clinical trials, my answer to that is there's a lot of men who just can't get access to clinical trials. What are we going to do with them? Forget them? Anyway, oh, and by the way, the drug I was trying to think of before for hot flashes, which... Um, also doesn't get great press from everybody was Megastrol, Megase. Yeah, Meg Megase is the same as Depo-Provera, only it's a pill form. It's a high-dose progestin 
it's basically the same as Depo-Provera, except one's an injection and one's a pill form. Very familiar with both of them. Um, anybody want to talk to anyone else maybe who's doing or is considering doing radium-223 for Figo? Wants to talk to Steve about the Gornstein protocol, three early, three late. Um, well, you, you know, I wouldn't call it the Bornstein Protocol. It was just my bright idea to go on to ProVenge. And I, I do think the ProVenge amounted to nothing but a pain in the ass. And I don't know if it did anything, frankly. I mean, it's, it's just making the Red Cross a lot of money, you know. And, and I don't know how they came up with this thing. This is, seems like this is this seems like leeches and bleeding, you know. That's It's in that category. But anyway, um, uh, I must say, having spaced out every one of the oncologists I've talked to, and Rick knows the three oncologists I see, 201, they said, now, now you should take it because the clinical trial was done every four weeks times six dosages, and you really should do it. And, uh, you know, I said, well, did they do a clinical trial on three doses and then they're taking six months off? Well, no, then so how do you know it didn't work? You know, so, I mean, as long as they've not done the clinical trial, you know, again, it's your body. I mean, ultimately, you're the one that has to decide how you want to manage this stuff. Yeah. Just, just making the observation. And by the way, I think you should walk into your meeting when you finally do get to meet Larry Fong face to face and say exactly what you just said to us about Provenge, and then come back and tell us what he says. Since he's the principal, since he was the principal investigator for Provenge. Yeah, don't record this one, Rick. Don't record this one for a few months, then, okay? okay. <laughs> okay. I don't think what I said about leeches. It is high-tech leeches. They're very high-tech leeches. <laughs> I, I went through ProVenge too, Steve, and I, but only after I read the the uh, the studies, and they convinced me that there was a possibility that there would be, you know, a prolongation of lifespan. Yeah. The problem, as you know, that you don't know <laughs> whether yeah. or not you're having an effect until you're dead. Um, yeah. Exactly. That's the only outcome is you die, right? Yeah. But I don't. It it seemed uh, like the odds that it would have a beneficial effect were great enough, and the the cost um, in terms of the inconvenience of going in for the uh, leukapheresis, you know, every couple of weeks and all that stuff. Not to mention the financial costs, which fortunately my insurance paid 100% for, I decided yeah. it was, you know, why not? It can't hurt. It was that yeah. sort of thing. And for your benefit, Provenge or Cipulusal tea costs about 130,000 US dollars here for the three three cycles. That's yeah. pretty, pretty pricey. Yeah, I, I had three cycles and it was 125,000. Yeah. Right. Um, and Steve, whilst we're talking about this, apropos our little discussion on, on nutrition and your view that nutrition, that, that, that diet and nutrition is focus, focus science because it isn't based on double, on, on random double blind trials. I think that's, I think that would be a fair way to quote you. No, no. What I said is oh. there's retrospective evidence yeah. that diet impact the disease there but as a scientist and bill i mean you know this as a scientist you can't say that it does until you've done prospective double blinded and there's no way to really design that that experiment so all i said is when you talk about nutrition you just say there's there's evidence that suggests yeah. that's all you can say. Yeah. well I'm, i i didn't say go out and eat yourself a steak every night uh, i'm i'm <laughs> actually just using this as a segue to advertise the fact that next Monday night we've got Greta McCare with us who is the um, UCSF uh, Cancer Center dietitian who's going to be making a presentation so all those questions you had in your mind about nutrition store up come back on and, you can, and you can challenge Greta directly because I for one would like to hear exactly how she's going to answer you because I'm I ain't the scientist. I'm not, I'm not attending, Bill. I'm telling you right now. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, and for those of you who might want to attend, because I actually think this would be, 
I know Greta well, and she is wonderful. And um, we, I, I did a made a web page today on the Answer Cancer um, website. I just put it in the box, and um, the, it will be a plenary session for everybody. And, and I'm going to try and we're going to try and get the word out on some of the other. Uh, Sites. And if you if you have never had the opportunity to listen to Greta talking about the importance of nutrition, uh, supplements, and diet for prostate cancer, um, I guarantee it will be well worthwhile. We will record it; it will be available afterwards. Um, Tom Van Zant, you're back with us. Tell us what's going on, Mr. Van Zant. Um, I would say basically nothing; just a pretty good remission. So I'm happy. I take my pills and I keep my head down. You know? That's good. What what's going on with your PSA? What what? Um, I can't remember. You were on. You, you'd started either uh, uh, Zytiga or, or um, Abiraterone or extant or Enzalutamide. Isn't that right? Zytiga, yeah. Right. And how are you doing on that? Uh, good. I, I did try a little game where I was taking less than you're supposed to, and my PSA started to go up right away, so I went back to taking it as prescribed, and it's working very well for me. Who knows how long, but it's working. You know? so, so give, us the, uh, give us the skinny. What, what's going on with your PSA? The last, what's the last I have here? I'm just looking. Um, it's coming out less than 0.01. Really? Yeah. yeah, and my my PSA was never very well controlled mm -hmm. with uh, just Lupron or even Lupron and Casadex. It was hard to hard to keep it below a three. And as soon as I went on Zytiga, it went down and stayed down. Well, I mean, I have a note here that back in in this time last year, a year ago, your PSA was around eight, and, and we got yeah. and it, we got it, and it dropped right back. After you started, the yeah, I think that's that's probably when the Casadex failed, yeah. and before I got on the Zytiga. Have you um have you tried? Have you considered? Maybe there's no reason, but have you considered using the um, abiraterone with food or not? I'm having trouble with your audio. Abiraterone, abiraterone, and what? With food. Take oh. It. Food. Yeah, I, I, I tried that, and that's when my PSA started to go up again. Okay. Taking taking less abiraterone and, and taking it with food, and uh, the the doctor okayed that little experiment, but I regretted doing it. Okay. And you you still seeing the guy at Fox Chase with the, the Russian guy, with the Russian name? Yeah, his name's Gynasman. Right. Last last time last uh, visit I went down, all I got was a physician's assistant. But I don't really care when I'm in a remission because, oh, you know, I was there to get a shot. I got my shot, and I'm not having any problems. So, you know, what are they going to do for me anyway? Nothing. You know, I care if if my PSA is rising. I don't want to see a physician's assistant. Any um that and, and and that's something everybody should should pay attention to. You know, we had a guy on the call last week who um, is seeing a nurse practitioner at UCSF and making decisions whether to go on or off abiraterone. If it were me, I would not be doing that. I mean, if you're going to make a key decision, make sure your doc's there. Don't, don't, don't accept anybody less than your, than your main man, um, is what I would recommend. Um, how about exercise? Are we getting any? Yeah, well, I take this guy walking with me every day. We do. About two miles a day usually, take him for a walk, and then I do. I've been feeling better, so I could do work around the house. I I just rewired my garage, just put on the wiring in there, you know? so I get my exercise. Good. So um, we managed to have killed off another couple of hours, and guess what? Anne still has her eyes open. You're looking great, there. Listen, um, you heard us in action. Um. We would love to collaborate with you. I mean, Answer Cancer would love to collaborate with you to help you train your moderators. We have some training tools that we use. Um, there's any way that you know we can get a little press along with 
your launch. We would be very grateful. We are very hopeful that we're going to start a breast cancer call and a kidney cancer call in England in the fall, in autumn. Um, I think it's going to happen. And of course, our um, our mother load is, uh, is is prostate cancer. And you know, I'd be happy to work with you if you if you, if you need peer moderators. I, I'm happy to work with you and with your moderators. Um, has this been enlightening? It's been absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much. And thanks to all the guys for being willing to speak, even when I'm here. Um, uh, it, it's, it's been really useful for me just to see how the conversation flows, actually, in this setting. Um, because obviously it's one of the big questions for us, you know, you know, when you're not actually in a room together, how well does it work? Because, you know, we're all used to using video conferencing in um, business settings and things like this. But um, it's slightly different when you're talking about a support context. Um, so it's been really good to see how well it can actually work. Um, so thank you for that. It's it's been really really useful, and I've really enjoyed hearing what you've all um, had to say um, as well. So thank you for having me along, and uh, I'm sure we'll continue discussions. But oh, absolutely! And by the way, we do this. This is the only call that we do record, um, but the guys know we record it, so it'll get posted on our website. Um, Probably within the next 12 hours. It depends how tired I am and um, when I get to it, but it will get posted on the website relatively soon. Um, but we'll make sure that uh, it's not a, we'll, we'll put a block on it for Larry Fong. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for joining us, Anne, and feel free to join us anytime. Uh, thanks very much. Thank you for staying up uh, to this ungodly hour for you. <laughs> Hey, what is it? One, is it one o'clock now here in, in England? And good luck. Good luck with your efforts to set up a virtual support group in uh, Great Britain. I think that that's a that's terrific that you're going to try doing that. I have participated in a, several uh, different support groups over the four years since I was diagnosed and. This one, by far, has been the most helpful. That's really good to know. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, your, your UK population also is very free to join us anytime. We, we are drop in. There's no charge. So, to the extent that you want to list this call on your resource page, or our low risk call, or um, we also have, as I mentioned, the inner conversations call, which um, uh, Jake, just in, in 60 seconds or less, since you are one of the moderators on the Inner Conversations call, tell Anne what we do there in case any Brits who can't sleep at night might want to join us. <laughs> well, if they, want to, if they want to fall asleep, they should listen into that call, yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, it's, it's called the Inner Conversations, which I mean, is uh, we, we stay away totally from is the one commandment that encompasses all what is that corruption uh, is somebody's tv i was like <laughs> anyway it's called inner conversations and it and it's basically it's not a technical call like tonight um but we talk about emotional aspects you know uh, how is our family reacting to this how are we reacting to this you know are we angry are we you know sad are we depressed and uh, we just kind of compare notes and, you know, it's, it's kind of like a, a place to vent. Um, <clears throat> you know, we, we do limit that to disguise. Uh, but we end up having a good time. You know, we end up telling some dirty jokes usually. And, uh, and we most of us leave. Go, we, we go in feeling worse than, go, than when we go out. We feel better as we leave. So and we do that every two weeks. Right. So if, if Jeff Sterling and his buddy ever want to join in on that one, give me a heads up and I can talk to him about, you know, how we're going to get Arsene Wenger out of the arsenal on the side. Uh, <laughs> the, um, and the other call we have is a caregiver's call, which is open to for all cancers, for stage three and stage four caregivers for any cancer. Um, and again, 
we, we, it, it, it's open to anybody, um, so feel free to advertise it as a resource. That's really cool. All right, guys, so that's it for tonight. Um, I will say one thing. I really appreciate the um, why so many of you wanted the earlier call. Because that later call when you're on the East Coast is, is, is quite hard, and, um, and I get it. So now that I've attended calls that started at 6 o'clock at night and 8 o'clock at night, um, I've actually, and I've actually moderated calls from the UK at, uh, at 11 p.m. and 1 a.m. It isn't easy, I know. So you, I also have your T-shirt, too. Um, all right. Um, I, Everybody, join us next week for the, um, for the for the nutrition call. It'll be great, and I'll talk to you all soon. Good night. Thanks very much. Good night. Good night. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night. And Steve, thanks for keeping me on the street and narrow there. Bye, guys. Bye, Bill. I'll, I'll call you a little bit later. Yeah, sure. Okay, that sounds good, Rick. Bye.